Committee's uh, Dean of Arts, Jim Murray, and uh, Chief Advancement Officer of UMB, uh, Bob Skillen. I'd also like to thank uh, Jennifer uh, Gavin, who did all the marketing and communications work, uh, the promotional work for the event. Uh, I was startled by the number of posters in uh, Tilly and Carlton. When I, when I walked to school, I, when I walked to class on Monday, I was starting to feel like I'd been reported missing. <laughs> I'd also like to issue a special thank you to Assistant Dean Stephanie Sloan White, who's done a great deal of work in organizing this series. Uh, her professionalism and enthusiasm make her a joy to work with. I'm sure that uh, other speakers in the series have said the same thing. Uh, well, I looked at the video too. Um, okay, uh, you know, I've worked with Stephanie on a number of projects now, and they always have two things in common when I work with her. One is they always seem to work out, and two, uh, they're always enjoyable. Um, Lastly, I'd like to thank the Associated Alumni and the other sponsors. Uh, it's a long and diverse list and points to the opportunities for collaboration between the arts faculty and the wider community. I hope that's the right thing to say, because I'm not used to thanking sponsors. I think the, I think the last time I was, I was sponsored for anything was when I was in Little League Baseball. So to the sponsors who are here, I'll, I'll try to play a good game. Uh, I'll try to demonstrate sportsmanship. The time frame for my lecture spans the history of New Brunswick as a distinct colony, then province. About 225 years, appropriate for our celebrations of spirit anniversary, I think. Um, my interest in the topic stems from following the contemporary public discourse on the crisis in the forest industry of about the last 10 years. Uh, and what I see is a lack of historical perspective on key political, uh, economic, and environmental issues. Uh, the main themes for my lecture this evening will, and, and it will be wide ranging, um, and I hope it, it holds together, uh, holds together well. The main themes are um, industrial transformations in the Brunswick forest industry during its history. I want to discuss how natural resource-based industries have life cycles that are ter determined by environmental, economic, and political uh, conditions. Secondly, competing ideologies concerning the role. Uh, of the public or crown forest in New Brunswick. I'd like to put forward the idea that the considerable level of disagreement and conflict between the pulp and paper industry and the people of New Brunswick over the last 80 years is rooted in differences between the modern corporate view uh, of provincial crown lands and the views held by a large segment of the population, particularly in rural communities. Uh, the third theme that I'd like to highlight tonight is how the history of previous transformations in the forest industries can inform the present situation and also how the present situation differs. Um, here I'd like to explore the notion that economic envir environmental indicators uh, suggest the need for a transformation of the forest industries. But as in the case with the transition from lumber to pulp and paper in the 1920s, that transformation has been stalled by entrenched political interests, which really has to do with control of the crown lands. So that'll be a theme. Um, just to start out, I'd like to uh, briefly uh, go, uh, go over some of the characteristics uh, of the uh, contemporary uh, crisis in the forest industries. One uh, that has been discussed a lot is uh, the high Canadian dollar. Uh, another is weak demand. And the weak demand for forest products um, is a function of a variety of factors, including the decline of the print media, uh, environmental sensibilities, the historical collapse of the U.S. housing market. Um, the Yako Pori consulting firm, a uh, worldwide consulting firm in the industry, forecasted that the demand for paper would rise at about 0.75 of 1% uh, in the decade from 2005 to 2015. Um, the worldwide demand, on the other hand, will increase about 2.2%, and in Latin America, Asia, and Eastern Europe, uh, that uh, increase in demand over that decade will be anywhere from 3.5 to 4.5 percent. Um, these figures are likely roughly accurate, which means that the demand problem uh, was, will probably not go away. Uh, what happens to the U.S. housing market is anyone's guess, but a return to the glory days of the 1980s and 1990s does not seem likely in the medium term at least. Uh, there's an inability to compete with newer producing regions. As Thomas Beckley of the UMB Forestry Faculty has suggested, and I quote, we are currently competing with developing nations with lower production costs and more lax, lax environmental regulations in order to supply fiber to developed nations which, in turn, make added value products, end quote. 
Um, the industries and markets which depend on producing high volumes to, uh, to prosper. Uh, New Brunswick is likely to uh, produce in the volumes uh, uh, necessary to prosper over the long term, uh, given the current configuration of the industry. Uh, there are significant barriers, both environmentally and politically, to radically increasing the volume of fiber taken from our forests. Pulp and paper is an extraordinarily energy-intensive industry. Uh, the existing companies are already um, experiencing problems, which does not bode well for expansion. Uh, the difficult climate for government assistance. For the past 40 years, uh, and, and in the crisis of the last decade, the federal and provincial governments have given considerable assistance uh, to the New Brunswick forest industries. In 2005, for example, the Lord government uh, rolled out a $250 million aid package. In 2009, to give another example, the federal government uh, rolled out a $1 billion nationwide uh, aid package targeted at mills uh, producing bioenergy. In New Brunswick, at least, that well seems to be running dry. The province is in another period of retrenchment, and aid to industry has, been weighed, has to be weighed against maintaining health, education, and other vital programs. The, diff the difficulties can be seen in the ways that the new conservative government has been grappling with the fiber and energy issues for the last year. Uh, implications of the crisis. Uh, mill closures. Uh, the mill closures and their impact on, on New Brunswick communities have been well documented. I, I would recommend in particular that people view uh, Ellen Rose and Tony Tremblay's film, The Last Shift, about the closing of the mill in Dalhousie. It's a really poignant, uh, balanced, and interesting uh, view of what happens to a community when the mill leaves. Uh, the provincial government has calculated that one half of the jobs in the forest sector were eliminated in the period from 2001 and 2008, about 7,500 jobs. In the well-regarded uh, Robertson Woodbridge, Woodbridge report, 2008, it was estimated that the volume of wood from private woodlot owners dropped from 1.1 million uh, cords per year uh, to 400,000 cords per year uh, from 2001-2002 to 2007-2008. Uh, 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 Woodbridge and Roberts referred to the variety of hardships that have beset the industry, uh, the forest sector, during the decade as a, quote, perfect storm. I want to turn now, and I think this is uh, probably the, the meat of the, of the discussion, to uh, forest industry uh, transformations in the past. Uh, the first thing I'll say is these brief uh, and wholly inadequate thumbnail histories are intended to reinforce the idea that resource-based industries have life cycles that are again affected by political, economic, and environmental factors. Um, the first significant forest-based industry after the migration of the loyalists in the 1780s was the, uh, the trade in ship masts and spars. Uh, the political context for the, the, the starting of this industry was the American Revolution, which cut off the supply of masts for the British Navy from New Hampshire and Maine. Uh, the industry probably would have come to New Brunswick anyway, as mast cutting is a very high-end and wasteful and migratory uh, industry. It depends upon a supply, or depended on a supply of large white pine of advanced age that was located within a few hundred meters along waterways that were sufficient volume to float the massive logs to port. It was estimated that at least one of two of the great pine were, that were cut for masts were rotted inside and left in the woods. New Brunswick was the principal supplier of masts to the British Navy in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, producing up to 3,000 great masts per year. By 1920, the industry had faded into history as the number of great white pines necessary for commercial production uh, were just not uh, uh, around anymore. Um, just as the industry passed through New Brunswick, uh, it had also passed through Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont in the last, uh, in the previous half century. Uh, it moved to Quebec after passing through New Brunswick. Uh, by 1910, the trade in square timber, the first major forest industry uh, in the colony, was gathering steam. Square timber was, is made by cutting pine logs that are at least 12 feet long, uh, 12 inches on the, and, and 12 inches on each side, and they're rough hewn uh, with a broad axe. The political context for the rise of the timber trade was Napoleonic Wars. In 1806, France began a policy of blocking British trade in the European ports that supplied the country with wood, mainly Sweden, Norway, Prussia, and Russia. 
British economic and military strategists were impressed with the seemingly endless stands of virgin pine uh, in the colony and the extraordinarily comprehensive system of uh, connected rivers and lakes. Uh, they began to advocate for trade policies that would encourage the development of a colonial timber trade. In 1811, British the British Parliament passed its first significant timber duty to encourage the trade. It briefly, in brief, it allowed for profitable timber making in New Brunswick and other British North American colonies by offsetting the transportation cost advantages enjoyed by their competitors in Northern Europe. In Euro Northern Europe. By 1816, New Brunswick was supplying 40% of British um, imports of square timber per year. It continued to supply 40 to 45% through the 1820s, tapering off over the next decade to 25% uh, by 1840. Just as the environmental and political advantages were responsible for the dramatic growth of the timber trade, so too did they contribute to its decline. Timber making was still a relatively high end and wasteful endeavor. It required large pines that occupied favorable locations for water uh, transportation, and it was estimated that uh, up to 20% of trees were left in the woods uh, in timber uh, 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 cutting operations. Similar to the pattern for the masting trade, the timber trade migrated in a northward sweep through the colony, uh, from the St. Croix and St. John to the Marish Michi and Restigash watersheds, as each successive river system experienced resource depletion. At the political level, a reconsideration of the favorable timber tariffs came on the heels of the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Already by 1820, the mercantilist economic ideology on which the tariffs were founded was being challenged by the new free trade orthodoxy that would dominate British economic policy in the second half of the 19th century. British North American political and industry leaders fought tirelessly uh, with notable successes to beat back the movement toward free trade in the 1820s and 1830s. The hammer was finally dropped in 1842 when deep cuts were made in the timber tariffs, making it very difficult to compete with northern European producers again. Subsequent cuts were made in the 1840s and 1850s, and the square timber trade faded into history by 1860. Um, the long lumber or deal trade. <clears throat> the problem with talking about 80 years of lumber industry history in about three minutes is that you have to leave out a few of the details. As the 19th century progressed, the lumber economy in New Brunswick became, became significantly more diverse in terms of markets and products. I want to focus really, though, on the trade in long lumber or deals, as they were commonly called, because it remained the foundation of the provincial economy uh, up until the final collapse uh, in the early uh, 1920s. Uh, a deal is a, is, a, is a roughly sawn plank of wood uh, uh, that's uh, at least 12 feet long, uh, seven feet wide, uh, in w seven inches in width, and at least two and a half uh, inches in thickness. Um, it was made in, in mills in New Brunswick and, and brought to finishing mills in, uh, in the British Isles. So it's a semi-manufactured uh, product, but uh, certainly there's more value added than, than square timber. Um, the long lumber trade was the first real manufacturing forest industry in the province. It began to develop in the 1820s in the St. Croix and St. John watersheds as depletion in pine trees suitable for square timber began uh, to be experienced. Uh, lumber had the distinct advantage of being a higher value added product, uh, which meant that transportation costs were not as great as a factor, and it also frequent, was frequently combined with shipbuilding, uh, promoting the development of communities. Literally, scores of communities along the lar many large and small rivers in the province were founded and or developed, uh, further developed with a sawmill as the focal point in the middle decades of the 19th century. The rise of the lumber industry resulted in the ascendancy of the so-called lord, lumber lords or lumber, lumber barons, who after 1850 dominated the economic and political life of the colony and province for three quarters of a century. In the rough and tumble world of New Brunswick colonial politics, the lumber barons controlled the legislature. Generally, an average of about 50% of members of the legislature were directly involved in the lumber industry well into the 20th century. They were also patrons of their communities intimately involved in the churches, education system, health care, and other aspects of social development. Within the legislature, they combined advocacy for their communities with a reckless pursuit of economic self-interest. The blend of political office with self-interest was reflected in the fact that each significant change in Crown land policy 
over the period from 1850 uh, to the 1920s was accompanied by either a major political scandal or a questionable political deal. The production of lumber exceeded the production of square timber in New Brunswick in the early 1840s and had its period of greatest expansion and prosperity in the decades from 1850 to 1880. By the 1880s, signs of resource depletion and declining competitiveness were appearing particularly on watersheds in the southern half of the province. The pattern was repeating itself. The cycle of, 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 of resource industries uh, was proceeding apace. By the late 1890s, when the science of forestry and the progressive forest conservation movement began to emerge in Canada and the United States, uh, there were already uh, serious problems with increasing operating costs as a result of resource depletion in many parts of the province. Uh, there was also increasing competition uh, from producers uh, in Central Europe uh, in, new, in new producing areas uh, that was visibly taking its toll. Uh, in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, when the um, Panama Canal opened uh, and opened the vast forests of the west coast of North America, uh, that, uh, that added increased competition, particularly uh, in the eastern markets of the United States. The first decade of the 20th century, therefore, witnessed a wave of business failures in the provincial lumber industry. By and large, the crown and private forest lands of the failed companies were bought out by pulp and paper companies, mainly based in the United States. The first decade of the century also witnessed the beginning of a 25-year saga concerning the development of hydroelectric power, particularly uh, at Grand Falls on the St. John River. So there was an interest during the first decade of the new century in the development of modern pulp and paper in the province, but it would be two decades before that became a reality. New Brunswick was, uh, in fact, slow to develop pulp and paper in comparison to other neighboring jurisdictions. In Maine, uh, Quebec, and Ontario, pulp and paper became the dominant forest industry before the start of the First World War. In New Brunswick, there was an open resistance to the development of pulp and paper among a significant segment uh, of the lumber barons, particularly on the Miramichi watershed. They saw the industry as a competitor and as e ecologically destructive. The latter argument was more than a little self-serving as their own cutting practices were coming under increasing scrutiny from progressive foresters at this same time. Nevertheless, the entrenched power of the lumber operators served as a barrier to modern pulp and paper development. They controlled the legislature, they controlled the rivers, and especially they controlled the crown lands. As had been the case for a century, control over the crown lands translated into, into political power and more importantly, control over the development of the forest industries. I think this is a point, uh, an important point uh, for understanding where we are today to jump forward a little bit because it is just as true now as it was then. Indeed, it should be a comfort to anyone here who doesn't like where this line of reasoning is ultimately headed that control over the crown lands is a source of enormous uh, power over the future of the industry. The transition to pulp and paper was further stalled by a remarkable revival of the lumber trade during the First World War. As many historians have noted, the Great War was a human tragedy of astounding proportions, but it was also good, historians have noted, for the Canadian economy, especially in the early years of the conflict. The buoyant markets resulted in almost unprecedented shipments of, of New Brunswick lumber to England and Europe. When the post-war recession came in the spring of, of, of 1920, most of the remaining firms in the industry found themselves overextended and went into foreclosure. As the province at the time depended on uh, revenues from crown lands for up to 50% uh, of its revenue, the crash not only produced an industrial and employment crisis, but also a fiscal crisis of the state. There were appeals for industry from government assistance, but there was no tradition of direct state, to, uh, direct aid, state aid to industry, and the government was unwilling to further reduce crown land fees, uh, which was part of the request. In a sense, the cupboards were bare. When the, conservative, <coughs> excuse me, when the conservative Baxter government was elected in 1925, it immediately began to tain, entertain offers and with the banks brokered deals to transfer the crown leases and private lands of the background, uh, bankrupt companies uh, to, the three, to three pulp and paper companies, International Paper, the Fraser Company Limited, and the Bathurst Company, 
In total, around 4,000 square miles of crown and, and private land were transferred to the so-called pulp triumvirate. With their pre-existing holdings, the three companies controlled close to 75% of the industrial uh, forest in the province by 1930. It was an un unprecedented concentration of resources uh, and radically altered the industri industrial geography of the province. The lumber industry continued to exist, but as a strictly secondary industry to pulp and paper. Its dependency on pulp and paper, uh, on pulp and paper industry for forest resources would be an ongoing issue in the generations to come. A second feature of the transformation from lumber to pulp and paper based forest, uh, from a lumber to pulp, pulp and based, excuse me, from a lumber to pulp and paper based forest economy was the privatization of the major hydroelectric power site in the province. Like many provinces in Canada, New Brunswick had a spirited debate over the issue of whether or not hydroelectric potential should be developed as a public or private utility. At the end of the war, International Paper Company owned the rights to develop the site, but showed little inclination to build a dam. In 1923, uh, after considerable public agitation and the lease of the company ran out, um, the agitation was from communities along the St. John River, uh, the Liberal government assumed control of the rights and pledged to electrify the valley. Nevertheless, uh, the Liberals lost the 1925 election before they could make much progress. Ironically, the very communities along the river that so strongly expressed a preference, preference for public power also voted heavily for the Conservatives in a virulent anti-French campaign against the first Acadian Premier of the province, Peter Venio. Also ironically, Bitterness festered in the valley over the almost immediate privatization of the Grand Falls site by the Baxter Conservative government, newly elected. And it lasted for more than 20 years until electric power finally came to all of the valley communities in the decade after the Second World War. Sometimes uh, bigotry goes a long way. From the beginning of the pulp and paper era, energy resources thus have been a finite in New Brunswick and a subject of debate in terms of apportionment and price. <coughs> the International Paper Company was given ownership over the Grand Falls development in preparation for building uh, uh, the Dalhousie Mill um, and with a stipulation that it provide power to the expanding Fraser Company operations in Edmonds. <coughs> One of the unfortunate episodes in the economic history of the province was that um, pulp and paper did not come close to fulfilling the promise of its promoters in government and industry for the next 20 years. The industry in the Northeast North America overexpanded dramatically in the period from 1923 to 1930. Already by the end of 1928, when the New Brunswick mills were starting to come online, the prices for pulp and paper products uh, were dropping quickly. When the stock market crash came in 1929, setting off a decade of uh, long Great Depression, the bottom fell out. Indeed, pulp and paper was among uh, the major manufacturing industries hit hardest by the Great Depression. It was New Brunswick's first experience with the age of multinational capitalism, and the onset of the Great Depression, just as the new paper mills were coming online, ensured that it would be a relatively rocky one. In forest-dependent communities not favored by proximity to the new mills, the structural problems of the pulp and paper industry were immediately, were immediately apparent. For the entire decade of the 1930s, the province's mills operated at no more than 50% capacity. None of the companies could even meet the minimum cutting regulations of their leases, principally as a result of the Fraser Company and International Paper reneging on signed contracts that they had with the province to build mills on the Miramichi. The end result was that the northern counties of the province, where the Crown Forest was concentrated, were identified by the federal government as among the most economically desperate places in all of Canada. It was within this context that the foundation of the historical grievances of the forest-dependent communities and working people of the province against the pulp and paper companies, which still resonate today, uh, were set in place. I think that's a, that's a significant point. By 1932, a broad-based, cross-class social movement had developed in New Brunswick to address the stru structural problems with pulp and paper. Labor and farmer groups protested against the lack of opportunities, low wages, and low, low prices paid for wood. 
local entrepreneurs, particularly those desirous of starting hardwood-based industries, argued bitterly that they should be given access to the crown lands that the pulp and paper corporations were not uh, operating. Local boards of trade, county councils, and other community groups joined the chorus in demanding that the provincial government either provide access or restore crown lands adjacent to forest-dependent communities to local people and entrepreneurs. Ultimately, the, con the controversies over the crown lands were rooted in a fundamental ideological difference over the role of the crown lands in New Brunswick. The modern corporate view of the crown lands was that they should be accumulated in the largest quantities possible and secured under leasing arrangements that approximated private or freehold land to the greatest degree possible. One of the provisions uh, that was negotiated uh, in the mid-1920s was that the tenure of leases uh, for pulp and paper, uh, which were previously 25 years, would be extended to 50 years uh, for the benefit of the pulp and paper companies. Crown land concessions were a vital asset in the sense that the larger the accumulation of forest reserves for any proposed mill development, the more attractive it was to the financial investment community. Large crown land concessions were also important because portions could be subleased to generate revenue over and above what was consumed in the mill. The responsibility of the leaseholder in this instance was principally, to the, uh, principally if not exclusively to the shareholder. This was not a conspiracy by any means. This was good modern corporate business practice. However, in the context of economic depression, modern corporate ideology was almost immediately challenged by more traditional no notions concerning the crown lands. A very large proportion of the people in the province's forest dependent communities considered the crown lands to be a public trust and believed that the role of the government was to administer them in ways that were, first and foremost, consistent with community development. Within this ideological construct, sound corporate practices like accumulating such large tracts of crown land that some of it was left uncut for decades or charging fees in excess of the government rates to local uh, entrepreneurs to cut on their leases were anathema to the principal function of the crown lands. Come back to that theme. Okay, state formation. We're gonna <coughs> we're gonna jump forward. Um, the quarter century from the end of the Second World War to around 1971 could be considered the, a golden age for the pulp and paper industry in New Brunswick. It was a time of considerable expansion, advances in technology, both in the mills and especially in wood harvesting, and almost inter an uninterrupted prosperity. For most of the period, the expansion and prosperity of the industry proceeded independently from a fundamental change in the philosophy of governance in Canada. The decades after the war witnessed the steady rise of state intervention in the economy and the proliferation of the social safety net uh, that is in place today. Oh, well, uh, well, it used to be in place anyway. It was, uh, it was mainly the result of the combined experience of the Depression when government was ill-equipped to deal with har the hardships of industry and the citizenry and the war when Canada prospered under an intensely planned economy. Overall, the Canadian public did not want to go back to the laissez-faire system that existed before the war. The area of regional development came in the late 1950s with the advent of equalization payments to the poorer provinces during the conservative Diefenbaker government. From there, the idea of, of state-sponsored region regional development took hold very quickly. Uh, during the next decade, during the 1960s principally, uh, we saw an alphabet soup of regional development programs introduced. ARTA, FRED, the ADB, and finally DRE, D-R-E-E, -E, the, Agriculture, the Agriculture Rehabilitation and Development Act, uh, the Fund for Rural Economic Development, the Atlantic Development Board, and finally the Department of Regional Economic Expansion. Glad I remembered all that. The elevation of regional development to a federal department status in 1968 was accompanied by a statement by then Premier Pierre Elliott Trudeau that his government considered economic inequality every bit as much of a threat to the nation as linguistic equality. Both signal um, what historians and social scientists have labeled the era of modernization uh, or even uh, high modernism. The era of modernization saw the enactment and bolstering of a variety of health, income support, educational programs for Canadians. 
It also saw the federal and provincial government provide billions of dollars to, de to develop new industrial enterprises and help existing firms expand. Much of this money was spent in the Atlantic region, and the pulp and paper industry was certainly favored by this new philosophy of governance. I've spoken and written publicly on the considerable amount of aid that the New Brunswick forest industries have received from the federal, the federal and provincial government since this era of modernization began, and I won't go into the details uh, this evening. I do want to say a couple of things uh, about the end uh, of the modernization era, which coincided roughly with the election uh, of the Brian Mulroney conservative government in 1984. <clears throat> I say roughly because depending upon your political persuasion, roughly can either mean around the time that the Mulroney government was elected or that it ended suddenly and violently when the Mulroney government was elected. <laughs> As a result of the so-called neoliberal revolution we have seen in the past quarter of the century, the steady elimination of and the erosion of health, education, and income support programs under the banner of free market economics. What we have not seen is the requ equivalent reduction in government assistance to, assistance to industry. Those proud titans of Canadian industry that champion the rugged individualism of a return to a pre-Keynesian economy continue to seek government assistance in lean times without a hint of irony. As the forest industries have gone through cyclical crisis in the past quarter century, government assistance has been forthcoming. Generally, the assistance is justified and granted on the basis of the jobs provided by the industry. However, like all good corporations, the major forestry firms in the province are really not interested as much in providing jobs as they are in making profits. When there have been opportunities to save money by replacing labor with capital, that is what they've done. The cautionary statement by Don Floyd, the current dean of forestry at UMB, should be given serious consideration by uh, this new conservative government. And I quote, what the mills will continue to do is to substitute, substitute high-tech equipment and capital for labor. The upshot of that is that the jobs will not come back. Forestry will not be the engine of rural development that it has been historically uh, in the past. Things have changed. I do not think it is realistic to think that five or 10 years from now, you will see those high paying jobs coming back to the mill towns. Okay. The, the, the introduction of uh, new technology, the replacement of, of capital for labor was particularly um, evident in the 1960s, 70s and 80s uh, in the harvesting phase of, uh, of uh, forestry production as the uh, industry moved from chainsaws to skidders to, to almost wholly now mechanical harvesters. Um, I'd like to turn now to the last part, and that is uh, comparisons and observations. I see three major continuities um, in the crisis slash transformation uh, of the forest industries now. Uh, and, and in the past. The first is that there are environmental indicators that the transformation is needed. Uh, even with the considerable downsizing of the industry, the remaining firms are still putting pressure on the provincial government for more access to fiber, as I'm sure they would not ask the government to cut into established conservation zones unless they really needed the fiber. We can probably conclude that the current configuration of the industry has little room for expansion and may, maybe even that it will have difficulty in maintaining the status quo in terms of wood supply. Secondly, I think there are parallels, uh, certainly with the transition from lumber to pulp and paper in terms of um, that political and politically entrenched interests uh, make the transformation in the forest industries difficult and may in fact stall it. As much as ever, control of the crown land translates into political power and control over the direction of the future of the industries. The crown lease holders have shown little or no interest in structural change and even less in experimenting and decentralizing the industry and opening access to a broader range of interests. The third continuity that I see is that the remaining major players in the, in the industry face the same ideological disconnect with the people of New Brunswick that the industry faced uh, almost from the beginning, uh, certainly from the 1930s. The notion that the Crown land is a public trust and should, should be used foremost uh, as an engine for community development is still strong. 
It could be seen in the last decade in the public reaction to the Acapora report, for example, and the response to the Crown Land Survey conducted by sociologists from UMB, uh, UDM, Edmonston, and the Canadian Forest Service, and in the independent media of the province. In terms of the differences, um, there's a major differences with other crises um, slash transformation and the existence of an environmental movement and changing environmental sensibilities. That's something which uh, was not faced by forest entrepreneurs and other transitions. So as Beckley has stated, while we have made some improvement over the years on the environmental side of forest management, the gap between the policies citizens desire and the policies governments put forth does not appear to be narrowing and may indeed be uh, widening. Um, I would call this, um, uh, you know, I would say that the industry, in some, to some respect, uh, is a is a victim of what I would call the Parcells syndrome. Uh, those of you who follow NFL football will know that Bill Parcells was the coach of the New England Patriots, among other teams, and he was a pretty nasty guy. And um, but he 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 did have a, a talent for pithy and and, and interesting statements. And, and one of the things that he said is. We are what our record says we are. So in fact, in the last 30 years, uh, the pulp and paper industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in, in improving its environmental record. But again, uh, the pulp and paper industry is what its record says it is. And in the last century, it's been the largest polluting industry in Canada. It's by its very nature a dirty industry. It uses a, an enormous amount of water mixed with chemicals which, pr which, produce, which produces runoff. Uh, it, pr it uses an enormous amount of energy, uh, which produces, uh, which produces uh, air pollution. Uh, it's, it's, it's traditionally, you know, with a budworm, uh, the budworm spraying uh, program of the 50s to, to the 1970s was the largest um, chemical spraying, aerial chemical spraying program in the history of the world. Um, so it faces an image uh, uh, problem uh, with regards to the environmental movement, and it faces an image problem with regards to uh, the changing sensibilities of New Brunswick citizens. And I think that's a very different, uh, uh, it's a very different environment uh, that they're operating in. I mean, people have a hard time, I would, I would include myself in this group, uh, believing that uh, a company that clear cuts and then uses herbicides uh, to kill the undergrowth uh, is really that interested in biodiversity, for example. So I think there are those image problems, and, and as, as Beckley suggests, they may not be getting better. Um, the second major difference is there much, there's much more possibility for state support than there were during previous crises and transitions, and it may be a factor that stalls the process of change. As long as the industry can maintain the status quo through government, uh, through government aid, uh, then there's less incentive uh, to, to enact change. On the other hand, uh, the unresolved power issue, uh, which has been going on now for six or seven years, seems to suggest that the industry is having a harder time uh, getting the aid it needs, or it says it needs. Thirdly, the industry faces aboriginal uh, issues with regards to access to the crown forest that were not pres pre present in any previous era. I would argue that the Crown Lands offer the best opportunity for reconciliation with the First Peoples of the province, which I regard as absolutely desirable and even necessary. The forays made in this area by the provincial government up until this time have been more a matter of crisis management than reconciliation. I just finished a sabbatical in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand used uh, its natural resources and control over its Crown natural resources as an instrument of reconciliation. It was, it was messy. Uh, it was imperfect, uh, but there was indeed reconciliation. It's what we need in Canada. Lastly, will there be a transformation and how will it happen? I don't really think anyone has a good answer to this. I, I have a hard enough time predicting the past. <laughs> There's certainly desire, a desire for change within the general population and a significant number of forestry professionals. They're ready and advocating change whether it be a transition to higher value added products, which is very common, or an acknowledgement and accommodation of a, a vari wider variety of forest values uh, and, a and a larger and more diverse group of forest entrepreneurs. 
Other provinces are experimenting with community forestry and changing their Crown Land Act, Acts to accommodate decentralization of control and manufacturing. When New Brunswick passed this major revision of the Crown Land Act in the early 1980s, it was considered state of the art. So the first step in, in any transformation, I think, uh, has to be uh, a change in the Crown Land Act uh, for the simple fact that as long as a few companies uh, control uh, uh, the Crown Lands, almost all of them now, uh, and they're not interested uh, in change in the way that the people uh, in the government of New Brunswick is, uh, then change will be very hard to come by. Uh, I'll end with that. Thanks. <laughs>